Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon on The Dairy Signal. We're excited to get things kicked off this week talking about success. Are you eliminating your success and how can we maybe achieve better by doing so on our farms and business? But before we jump into that, we're going to start things off with a little bit of today in history and a little bit of a Tuesday trivia, if you will. So today is National Chocolate Milk Day, which if you are a dairy farmer, if you have any appreciation for dairy at all, you know this is a fantastic day to be celebrating because of all the good nutrition that comes from chocolate milk. Um, You've probably heard that it's a great recovery drink, which is true because it provides great essential nutrients to help your body recover after a hard workout, which is perfect for those kids who have just got back into sports. Um, And it's also got a little bit of an interesting history that I didn't quite realize until I was looking it up a little bit ago. And it was um, that in the late 1680s, so many, many, many years ago, um, an Irish born physician named Sir Hans Sloan invented this delicious beverage. So um, he was serving as a personal physician for uh, English Duke while in Jamaica. And while he was here, he encountered, encountered a local beverage that was made up of cocoa and water. And when he first tried it, he thought it was the most disgusting thing he's, ta- he's tasted. Um, was not a fan, you could say, by any stretch of the imagination. But he knew that uh, it was really popular in that region and wanted to try and adapt it for his own taste. So he did so and created a recipe that actually included milk um, because it had that creamy texture that helps cut some of the bitterness of that cocoa. Um, And he actually brought that back to England and apothecaries actually introduced it as a medicine back in the day. So interesting history about chocolate milk you might not be familiar with on the normal day today. Um, today is national, also national corned beef hash day. So if you're into that, uh, grab yourself some for dinner. And it's also national day of forgiveness. So if you have been holding on to a grudge, let it go. Mm. Today's the perfect day to do so. Um, especially as not only we get into fall, we have I think hit uh, about a week into fall here. So it's a new seasoning, changing of the times, um, and a great day to maybe put aside some of those issues that we once had. But we are not here to listen to me ramble about fun facts, though I do enjoy them. Um, We are here to talk all about how we can set our farm up for success and what might be limiting us. So today with us, we have with us Liz Griffith, who is the market development and human resource consultant with Encore Consultants. And we also have with us Tim Schaefer, who is a certified family business advisor, and certified professional business coach with Encore Consultants. So thank you both for being here with us today. I know we're excited to get underway with this conversation, but before we do, um, I'm going to have each of you just give a little bit more information about yourself. So Tim, let's hear it. Who who are you? I know you've been on a few times before, but let's uh, hear the Cliff Cliff Notes version, if you will. I grew up on a family farm. and, and really have, have been working with uh, farm families for about a little over 28 years now. Started Encore Consultants uh, back in 2010. And uh, I, I like to say that we build um, uh, better businesses and lasting legacies. That That's kind of what we do here. So that is a great tagline if I ever heard one. Um, and Liz, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, Well, first of all, I'm a super fan of chocolate milk, so I'm really glad to hear it's National Chocolate Milk Day. Um, But besides that, I am from Wisconsin, and I have been involved in the dairy industry for over 30 years, both as a producer, manager, and consultant. Um, My passion is really the connection that I have with people and helping them with, you know, their people challenges. Well, I think we have a great pairing here today as we dive into this topic. Um, Before we do, I do want to remind that if you are watching live, make sure to take advantage of our two experts here with us today. Ask your questions. Um, And what's great about this is you can ask them anonymously, especially when it comes to stuff like this, where it's business related, maybe families involved, maybe you're having stuff with some of your management. Um, 
you can ask it anonymous, anonymously. And that is the beauty of it. You can get resource information and help through this program here this afternoon by using the Slido feature. If you are on a desktop device, it's right to your right. If you're on a mobile device, you can scroll on past the screen you see and type in your question below. So utilize the resources we have here today. But for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Liz to get us started. Okay, great. Yeah, and please ask those questions. Um, today we're talking about scaling your farm for growth and, you know, all the, the unlimited opportunities that you have as a producer. But what does that, you know, mean? Is it just adding more cows? Is it adding more acreage? Is it finding a new niche that, you know, your farm can get involved in to expand? And your reason for growing might be different from farm to farm. It could be that you're preparing for the next generation to come in. Maybe you have multiple next generations that wanna join the farm. Um, maybe you're just like, hey, we need a better balance between work and family life because what we're doing now is, you know, just working constantly and not really growing and, and be able to celebrate with our own selves and our families and friends. Um, so there's a lot, you know, to look at, and it's not, I think what we're going to talk about today is it's not just a simple thing of adding, you know, 200 more cows or adding 400 more acres. There's a lot more involved that you and your families and or partners need to consider. And so that's what we really want to share with you today, kind of get you in that mode of thinking of growing, but doing it in the right fashion that's going to be the most beneficial to you. Yeah, Liz, you use a, you use a, a word there. It, it's, I think it's really key, and that is balance. Um, you, you know, it, it's finding that, that right balance of, you know, as, as a farm grows or as you scale it up, you know, what practices, what management practices do you hold on to and which ones do you let go of? you know, managing a farm that that's 150 head uh, and taking it to say 2000, man, what, what a difference. And, and, and we wouldn't think about, you know, we wouldn't think about, uh, you know, using the same reproduction practices from 15 or 20 years ago. Um, but so often we find a lot of old, old, I don't know, not technology, but old practices being drug from one generation to the, to the other. And yet we can't throw everything out. That wouldn't make sense at all. So it's really, really about finding that, that, uh, that balance. So. Right. And you know, what, what may be limiting your scaling up, you know, what's holding you back? Is it just that you have so much to do in a day that there's no time for you guys to even talk about, you know, your visions, what you want to do in the future. I know in talking to people, probably the number one reason for, you know, not being able to scale up or putting off certain projects is the tight labor market. And obviously that that's crucial to our business and, and any business within the country. Um, that's something we have to consider. And, and that's why, you know, you may implement different technologies to help with that. Maybe things are just darn tight, right? The cost of inputs has gone up tremendously. The cost of outputs, maybe not as tremendously. And so you have that fear, like maybe this isn't the right time. And then of course you have your neighbors, right? And neighbors can be your competitors. Maybe they're neighbors that are not farmers, but are holding you back from doing change because, you know, as the saying goes, not in my neighborhood, or maybe there are other farms that you see as competition. And so you get nervous about, you know, taking that change. Another thing that, you know, we don't even have on here, but that's, that's the family dynamics, right? Maybe the older generation doesn't want any change and the newer generation is going, we need change. Um, kind of, you know, a little bit of what we were alluding to with the work and family life balance. So there can be, you know, many obstacles that are keeping you from scaling up the way you want to and in the way to be successful. 
So I actually had a question that came in um, right off the bat here. So somebody is really, really um, jumping the gun, which we love. Um, but I, and I don't necessarily want to st start on a negative note, but um, I think this kind of fits with that last slide. And it reads, what are some red flags you have seen that would be a reason not to grow? Because we love the idea of growth. I know for a lot of us, that is whether technology, whether helping people, whatever that means, we love the idea of growth and change for the most part within our dairy sector because it happens so often. But what might be some areas or reasons that you would say, you know, maybe now is not the time? I'm going to start. And I know Tim's got something to share because I can tell by his facial expressions. Um, you know, I've talked to a lot of people. They call, they call me and ask this exact question. And that's where you really got to take a deep dive, you know, into yourself, into your business. And what do you really want? And if getting bigger, adding more cows, adding more acreage, adding more employees is something you absolutely don't want. Well, obviously, then you shouldn't scale up. Um, you know, those those are pretty basic questions. If you're happy with the way things are going, you do have the family and work-life balance that you want. Do you need to make change? Maybe not now. Another reason might be the whole, you know, who's going to take over the farm if I go in deep and make this bigger? So if, you know, those are just things off the top of my head that if you don't have that in place and you haven't really thought out the transition of, you know, a, a larger business, then this might not be the time to scale up or make any changes. But deep down, you have to really want it too. So Tim? Yeah, great, great, great points. And, 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 and I, would, I would add to that alignment. If you're gonna scale and there's other people involved, family members uh, and, and such like that, People, they have to be aligned that that's what they want. So, so if it's like some of the family or some of the owners, they want to scale up and other ones are, are kind of more, you know, they're holding back for whatever reason. Maybe it's age, maybe it's the risk, what, what it, whatever it would be. Scaling up is not going to help, uh, help issues that are, that, that if there's an issue in the family dynamics uh, or with the family dynamics, especially around alignment of where we're taking this farm and what's important to us and how hard we want to work, then scaling up won't help that. That's a big red flag. Another one is um, when you scale up, really the, the owners or the, or the managers have to, often they have to let go of some things that maybe they really liked doing because their time is going to get pulled in so many more directions that that maybe maybe they can no longer... Uh, maybe they need to be hiring people to do certain things, but doggone, they really like doing it. Well, you know, that kind of comes with the territory. So um, being able to let go of, of some of those things that, that might be a lot of fun, but they're, but, but they're just not the best use of the time. And, it, and if people say, I'm not really, I don't want to let go of that. I want to keep doing exactly what I'm doing. Well, then maybe scaling up isn't the, isn't the right, right thing for you at, at, that, at this time. And Tim, you bring up a good point. I was just thinking of a, a story, a conversation I had with a farmer not that long ago. And it was the family dynamics where uh -huh. there was a couple of young couples, which is interesting. And one young couple wanted to scale up and the other couple absolutely did not want to. And they were asking me, you know, what do we do? And you kind of really have to take a step back and go, if this can't work, right, what what's next? Do you merge with another farmer? Do you just get out totally or, or let them continue to farm the way they want and you go on to something different, you know, maybe working for another farmer or finding those things that you love to do? And again, hard questions, hard decisions. But as Tim, you know, just kind of said, everybody has to be in alignment and everybody has to be happy with those yeah. decisions. I think those are some great points to consider, but let's move on to, you know, some happier thoughts uh, as we continue on to today's discussion as if we are going to be scaling up and growing. Yeah. So um, 
th- this really comes down to kind of my last thought uh, of alignment of, of roles and responsibilities. And uh, these are these are these are two farmers um, that 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 I know. Uh, their names have been changed and and other identifying information, but two very different approaches to scaling up. Uh, Lon, the guy on the left, um, you know, solid finances. He's he's running nine employees. Now this is not a dairy farm. This is a row crop farm, but he's running thirty two thousand acres under center pivot irrigation. Um, he's got a steady stream of employees that want to work there. Um, he's got people calling all the time for land opportunities. This guy is extremely relaxed. I, if you spend a day or two with him, his phone, his actual cell phone may ring maybe three times. Uh, and, and what that allows him to do is to really focus on the, on the strategic part of the business. Another guy by the name of Richard, he also scaled up his operation and he took it from just himself with with a tractor and a digger to now he's he's running uh about 10,000 acres he's got 10 full-time employees and he is run absolutely ragged uh his phone if you can get 30 seconds of 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 uned- of you know <laughs> concentrated attention from him you're doing really pretty good because it's a two-way radio it's the phone and uh and and he is running absolutely ragged um but they both scaled up, but they did it in two very, very different, different ways. And, and, um, and, and, you know, you think about the dairy owner that, you know, they, they scale up and their phones are ringing throughout the night. They're getting these phone calls from the parlor. Um, you know, no detail is too small uh, for their time. And, and it, it, scaling up can really run uh, a, a person ragged or if it's, or if it's done very deliberately, um it, it can be a lot of fun. It can be a lot of fun. And we're going to kind of focus on, on the, on the fun part of it here, here too. So. And I'm sure anybody listening here, we can all, you know, think of people that fit these two, two that he's talked about, or maybe we're thinking of ourselves and we see some of each one of us in there. And, you know, again, that's okay. We're just trying to point out some of the differences. Yeah. So, so go, go ahead. ahead. Real quick uh, on Richard. So, and look at that. Okay, number one, Richard is not happy. He truly is is not a happy person. He's making a lot of money, but he's frustrated. He's even more successful, more successful than he ever thought possible. But he's just uh, completely stressed. And um, uh, he'll admit my financial management is loose. My re- human resources doesn't exist. Uh, everything has to run through him. He's kind of that skinny part of the funnel. And, uh, but he's managing the farm the same way is, is when he had like one employee and, and was significantly uh, smaller. So um, that's, that's kind of where Richard's at. Um, I found that there's roughly three categories or three, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of three methods of, of, of producers out there. Um, and I call them the experts, the managers, and the, and the professionals. And, um, and they're very, very different one from the other. And, and it's, not that, um, it, it's not that this is a recommendation that one person has to be one or one person has to be the other. It's just kind of a more of, I'm bringing this up so that maybe all the listeners can think about kind of where they're at and where they want to be. Uh, the one thing, whether you're an expert, a manager, or, or, or run a professionalized farm, you can all be happy, you can all make money, you can all have success. Um, let's talk a little bit about experts. You, they can do everything, but really, frankly, they must do everything because they're almost always alone. But they have a lot of freedom. They have full control over their day and their time. Um, we, we see a lot of very contented farmers here. And, but, but it's really hard to, to grow the operation because all the work is being done by, by maybe one or two people. Um, when we talk about the kind of the managers and, um, and, and that part of the, the industry, they have a lot of things going on, right? They are the Richards out there and they have either family or employees working and things are moving along the benefit. You know, is that it's it is scalable, right? 
but it's really only as scalable as long as the manager has the capacity, the, the time, the energy, and the skill to keep all those balls in the air because everything is being run right through, through the manager, uh, that, that manager type. And then there's a professional, and they're probably the most scalable. In other words, you could take it from 1,000 animals to 3,000 animals to 10,000 animals or even more, and it's kind of just rinse and repeat. Everything kind of has a flow to it. Uh, there's a rhythm. There's a flow. There's a lot of delegation of duties that go to employees who, who share not only the workload, but also some uh, decision-making as well. Um, kind of the downside to, the, to this sort of operation is that a lot of times these, these operators, they're spending less and less time in the trenches. And some people say, well, that's where all the fun stuff is. So, so there's a pro and there's a con. Um, to, to really to really all, all different types of, of farms. It's, it's just so important though, that you understand where you're at and where you wanna be and, and be really deliberate about what type of uh, operation uh, is gonna bring you the most happiness and success. And it's not something that you just decide, oh, I wanna be this today and it's gonna happen. I mean, yeah. speaking from my own you know personal experience, I can think of a time when we were what we called the experts Mm -hmm. Um, and it worked and that's what we did. And then we became the managers, but we struggled with that for a while too, because of letting go, right? All of a sudden now you have employees, you have more decisions to make. And yet as you know, the farm owners, we wanted our hand in every little bit of, of decision-making, um, every little bit of the fun work as you know, Tim just mentioned, and then, you know, we kind of progress to the professional. And again, it, it takes time um, and it, it takes a commitment to make some changes. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. But, you know, from personal experience, been there <laughs> in all those yeah. trenches. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of what we're going to talk about is not really about production. Uh, I mean, if, if there's one thing that the American farmer and the Amer American dairyman uh, can do it is produce, and they they are so good at it. They're reinventing themselves all the time. Um, but but really, when we're talking about scaling, it, it's really not so much about scaling production. That's not. We don't want to say it's the easy thing, but it's something that farmers that they tend to grasp that a lot faster. What we're talking about is something different. And I'll just go back to my grandfather. Um, you know who is long gone but when he started farming in the in the early 40s you know it was all about how hard how hard a person could work literally how hard can they work and there was some other things too is like how how straight he could plant his corn because when he planted straight rows he was fussy about that which meant that which, which meant that his weed control was a lot better which meant that his yields were higher and it all just it all just trickled down and um and, and he was able to increase his production uh, fairly substantially like that way. But how hard is it to move the needle on any part of ag production by 10%? It's really, really hard. Um, you know, but, but th let's think about it. What would happen if your farm, if, if all farms were 10% better at managing conflict, at 10% better at, at working towards a common vision, 10% better at, at communicating, 10% better at hiring quality employees. The thing is, is that those, that, those small 10%, they really add up to really profound increases to the bottom line. Um, you know, we see the same things that come up over and over again. You know, there's not enough long-term planning because everyone's caught up in the daily whirlwind and, and maybe there's not enough people or maybe the, there's good people there, but but they're not in the right spot. Um, maybe there's problems that just get rolled over at challenges, issues year after year. They don't really get solved. They just kind of get tabled, you know? Um, yeah. So, so it's, so it's hard. So it's hard to get full, uh, you know, a lot of times on farms, there's a lot of action, but, but is that full traction really taking, taking root as, as farms scale up? And that, that's, that's a kind of a key question. 
Well, and I want to ask a question um, a little bit about okay. this, but also kind of more as we were talking about the expert, the manager, um, mm-hmm. as well as like the professional. And so yeah. this is a very interesting concept because I see, you know, we have a lot more shifting towards that professional, but um yeah. And I don't want to generalize, so I pardon, pardon me if I am, but I want to say some of the older generations or even people in my father's generation, I don't consider him old yet, which I hope he appreciates, um, yeah. is that so much of Deering has changed within not only the last 50 years, but the last 20 and 10. So like you think about how when a lot of these people started farming, it was they were a lot more hands on, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, And that was the reason that they love farming because they were able to be a farmer in that traditional sense. And so the idea of changing out of that is sometimes scary, or maybe they just don't want to, it's not their desire. Right. And also you bring in the other aspect of, okay, we do need growth. Maybe that they are having that next generation come in, or it's something along those lines where growth is happening regardless of maybe that one person who really wants it to be X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. Uh, So how, how do you manage that? Because you can still have so many different dynamics of people on the farm in different levels and positions and experiences, um, but have vastly different areas of where and how the dairy industry is changing, even within um, a central unit. Yes. She just totally prepared for this next conversation. So perfect. Go, Amber. (laughs) Okay, I'll let you continue on then. (laughs) Yeah. Um, There are about six key six key areas that that farms can focus on as they're as they as they scale up. And and on, you know, at the top of that is strategy. And we've already kind of touched a little bit about that. Um, and, and then there's people and issues and scorecards and standard operating procedures, all that. But if you think about it, the, there's really there's really what we call the healthy side and the smart side. And farms spend a lot of time. And they're smart, right? Dairy men and women today, they spend a lot of time on the smart side of, of, of this wheel. And um, but a lot of times the real success and the uh, either the success or the failure, it, 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 it comes from either attention or inattention on, on the healthy side. And so oh, we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit uh, more and I'm, I'm looking at the time and we're running just a smidge behind here. Um, so we're going to skip just a little bit. Um, so when we talk about strategy is like, where's this farm going? Where is this where you want to stay? Is there something else? How are we going to get there? And and when we think about strategy, it, it's like what's our personal vision for ourselves? What's you know, right? And, and that may be the older generation, right? My personal vision for myself is that I'm out there in the in the trenches. But it also may be that there's a lasting legacy uh, that goes on to generations, and that may that may require uh, some changes. So so it's really important that everyone's you know, their, their personal vision for themselves and, and, and what they, what they, you know, what they want for themselves and what they want for each other and what they want for the business, that, that it's all out there on the table. Um, and, and that there's a real, that there's a real strategy. Um, I'm going to interject here. Because interject. Needs to be out on the table. Yeah. So many times we are all as the next generation, so hesitant to share yes. where we want to go. Yes. Not just with the business, but maybe with our role. And so what Tim's saying is, you know, it's really important that all this is shared. Um, so before you can come together with a common strategy, you got to understand what everybody's wants and needs are. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we call them values and vision, right? And uh, where do we go? Why is it important? Um, you know, is it high growth? Is it maintenance? You know, what, what does that look like? Um, and, and, and the, and when you're all said and done, it, it's about, it's crystal clear, it's detailed and it's shared by all. There we go. Um, Liz, do you, do you have any, anything to add on this or? Well, again, it just goes back to to the sharing. So I'm going to just take, you know, again, personal experiences. You're on a farm. 
the elder generation, they come up with the, the vision, right? Mm -hmm. um, this was just in my case. They didn't really share it. They didn't maybe share it until already the blueprints are there and an expansion is starting. And it's like, whoa, how are we going to do this? So, you know, it wasn't crystal clear to us, um, was to that person. It wasn't detailed in the sense of, well, what's next if we do this? Um, and the other important thing is shared by all. And we say that, okay, yeah, as the owners, we all should know and understand it. Well, what about your teams and yeah. what about your employees? So it's really important that you bring them in on some of these conversations. I mean, granted, they're not going to make the final decision whether you expand or grow or, or change roles, but they are an integral part of the success. And so if they're part of it and understand the hows and the whys, things are going to be more successful. Great, great point on the employees. Um, one thing that really, really drives employee engagement is when they understand the big picture and they understand how they're, how they fit into it. And the beauty of that is, even though it can seem a little scary, uh, you know, letting your employees know kind of what, what some, some plans are, um, they will help you problem solve versus just being reactive. So if they, if they don't see that big picture, they're in reactive mode all the time. But if they can see that big picture, they can. The, they're smart people as well, and they'll they'll connect the dots. And when they're able to, when they're able to help you towards the the overall goal of harm, they feel good about it. Their engagement goes up, and um, and the the odds of employee turnover go down when when they're fully engaged. So there, there's some real benefits, even though it can, even though it can seem a little scary. And, um, and those employees could also just be the younger generation, so yeah. it doesn't have to be a you know, non-family hired employee. I mean, yep. we're talking about everybody on that farm. Yep. yep. Um, just a just a little side note. For a while there, it was, and, and this is this is just um, this is my opinion for what it's worth. Uh, there was a big uh, a, a big push. You know, we got we have to have a fancy vision statement. We have to have a fancy this or that. You know what? Uh, make it as simple as possible. Just as long as it works. Don't don't feel like you have to, um, you know, plaster all this up on your walls and, and things like that. But but it does. But the people have to, you know, they have to know that it's out there so that they can work towards it. So, um, people, which is right in Liz's uh, Liz's uh, yeah. bailiwick. Yeah, I mean the people. The people is key, and as your considering scaling up, um, you need to think about, do we have the right people, first of all, here to do so? And as Tim said before, you know, are they in the right positions? Are they in the right seats? So you may have had a key employee or a key family member that you think is absolutely wonderful, and they've been with you for 20 years. But as you look at changing or scaling your business, maybe they're not in the right seat for the next phase and that's okay but by good communication you know and, and having those conversations you can make those changes but that's really key to your strategy is you know having the people and then we can talk about things you know in the people category such as HR right if you're growing and you're getting bigger now it's like well who's going to take care of the people who's going to hire them who's going to train them and I get that a lot. And, it, you know, the answer I get is I don't have the time. I'm not good with people, you know, right? I'm good with cows. Hence the reason most farmers are introverted. That's okay. But then find someone who is good with people. And preferably, you know, that'd be within the leadership team, within the family. Um, but maybe it's a key employee. Maybe you have to hire, you know, outside. But those things really have to be thought about because you can't do any of this without the people. Yeah, it's you. I mean, we encore, right? I mean, that's, that's what we do is, is we help coach and, and such like that to help build, build up uh, managers and owners so that they can run with it themselves. To Liz's point though, yeah, if it's not your strong point, get it hired. However, um, 
it's really hard to hire everything done, right? And and, and this goes back to be 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 um, be certain before you start scaling up that 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 you're going to have to change some things on 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 how you do it. And if you truly don't like managing people and you truly don't like doing some of these things, uh, maybe you want to rethink before you scale up because. Well, you can get help. It still is going to come back to still is going to come back to the owners on on, um, you know, they still have to manage some things. I, I guess you can't hire it all done. Right. And, and that uh, kind of goes to, yeah, this next slide. And I'm just going to add because it's part the last one, part this one. But when you scale up, yeah. you have to also get yourself in that mode to delegate a lot yeah. more and to trust and to give people true responsibility and accountability because you can't do it all. So, and again, that's part of having them in the right positions so that you can effectively delegate. What, okay, so question off of there, um, what if you are somebody, and maybe this is a personality trait you know you have, that you just are not good at trusting others or you're, you know you micromanage or you just, have the desire to be in the thick of it, how or any tips to help somebody who's like, I know we need to get to that point where I can just trust my employees to do and know that they are capable, or maybe they do know they're capable, but again, it's that micromanagement part of it. Um, any tips for somebody in that situation? Well, I'm just going to say, if you know that about yourself, right? So think about the role you really want and then the role you need to fill or the role that is filled, but you know what responsibilities are they going to have? And as, as hard as it is, I think with you know that good communication, sitting down in a meeting and saying, "Okay, I'm willing to you know give up these responsibilities," but because I'm nervous, and you don't flat out say this to your employee, but in what way are you going to track their accountability? right? Is there a report they need to bring you? Uh, maybe you have daily, we're going to talk about this too, daily meetings, um, weekly reports, something that's going to give you that satisfaction that you know, okay, I've let go. I know it's getting taken care of and the results are good. And it's again, you can't snap your fingers and, and change overnight, but you learn to flex and accept and, um, you know, but again, have clear expectations of what you're looking for. I think that is a great thought. Just the fact, you know, so just on this question, just the fact that the, that, that, that you or whomever you're thinking ever acknowledge that they're not good at something. That's a real plus, right? Oh, yeah. That is, that is a real plus. It, it's really where people go into, into a new project or scaling up with, with blind spots that they're not even aware of. Um, but, but going into it with your eyes wide open and really, you know, having that, you know, look in the mirror sort of thing. I was like, Hey, this isn't me. That's, that's a real positive. That's a real positive because you know what we could, everyone, yeah, you, know, you can work around, you can work around it if, if you know that it's there. Um, you know, when when we look at the right people, we're looking for the right people, but also having them in the in in the in the right spot. Uh, you can have really great people, but they're just they're just in the wrong spot at the farm. So you so you got to have both. You, you can have uh, you, you know several different scenarios, but but let's face it, many tasks on the farm they can be taught, right? And it, 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 it may take some time, but but a lot of times. These, these tasks can be taught, but attitude can't be taught. And so, uh, so often, you know, we hire and maybe we interview on skills that people already have. Um, but, but instead, you know, hire, hire instead, of, do they, do they align with, with where we want to go, right? With our vision, do they align with our core values, right? Do they, do they have that before, before you really jump into, you know, can they drive the Bobcat sort of thing? Um, because um, your long-term employees that really help you towards your vision are the mm -hmm. ones that are going to be in alignment, uh, alignment with some of the some of these core values first. And and once again, it's hard and it's scary. But if there's somebody that's pulling down the rest of the team, don't be afraid to fire them. Right? Good employees often leave because 
they're tired of working next to poor employees. So. And I've seen that happen. I'm, I hate to say it, but <clears throat> hundreds of times where, you know, a business has kept a talented worker, yep. but that person was not good with people. And yep. I'm not talking, they were even in charge of HR, but it's the way they treated people. Yep. Um, it was the way they, they gave orders and it would bring, you know, the whole team down. And instead of standing up for themselves and asking for change, they just leave. And that's where you get that turnover. Yeah. Um, another thing that farms get as they scale up is that they're going to have more challenges. They're going to what we call issues, right? They're going to have more things that pop up that they have to, that the leadership team has to make a decision on. Um, and there's going to be more of them and they're going to come faster because the operation is just simply larger. Uh, you know, have we have, I think we've all been at meetings, right? Where they last for hours, right? People come late to the meeting. They last for hours. There's no agenda and there's a lot of discussion, but, but people walk away saying, okay, what did we, what, you know, what did we agree to? What did we solve? Or maybe there's an issue or a challenge that kind of, kind of just keeps circling it and circling it. And it never gets solved. And then after a while, everyone keeps, they quit talking about it because they're like, well, that's an unsolvable challenge. Um, you know, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, you know, having a great meeting structure, but then also having a way of, of identifying root causes of the challenge and coming up with a game plan. Um, it, it's, it's really important. Yep. Uh, so often with issues, we have challenges that come like, oh, yeah, I, I have to deal with that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it gets forgotten. We're, we're, we're a real big component, uh, proponent of creating what we call issues list. Write it down. Yes, this is a decision. This is a challenge we have. To, and, and you just and you just write those down so that they never get forgotten. And, and our encouragement is, is that everyone can add things to the issues list. It's not just one person. And then, uh, and then when you do have your meetings, you've got something to, you have something to work off of. And it feels really great and really awesome when, when you can look back over the last 12 months and look at all of the decisions and all of the challenges that you guys have solved together as a, as a ownership group or as an employee group. So. And that fits, you know, nicely with the scorecard. And when we're talking about scorecards, as farmers, again, we're used to certain scorecards, meaning we watch our milk production, we watch our somatic cell, we watch, you know, our pregnancy rates, et cetera. But there's other scorecards and those scorecards kind of come off some of the things like your goals, your strategy and your issues, but you don't want to wait until a full year is up to see how you're tracking. So if you're in a growth mode, you know, maybe you need to set up scorecards for shorter goals, if you yeah. will. This is where we want to be in three months. This is where we want to be in six months. And how can we measure that? And how can we talk about it to see, you know, is it working? Is it, are we getting a high enough score, if you would, um, to make us feel comfortable with that next scaling up or strategy process? Yeah, a scorecard doesn't tell you the final score, just lets you know if you're winning or not. Make, makes it, you know, if you look up there on a scoreboard, it, it, there's a lot of information up there that, that really uh, paints a picture that, that, uh, that you can use, like Liz said, before the end of the year, right? Before it's too late to actually make any adjustments. So, yeah, um, yeah there's all sorts of examples that people use for scorecards. So like if a communication is a challenge, Hey, we're just not communicating enough, but we but we believe that we should uh, have a daily huddle for ten minutes every day. Then track, you know, set 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 a minimum. Hey, we're going to have you know a daily huddle, and the minimum that we're going to accept here as our team is uh, is is uh, four out of six, um, wh whatever it is. I, I mean, you can create a scorecard that's pretty easy for just about just about anything. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I was looking at something. No so worries. then again, this all flows, proven processes. 
when we think of proven processes, meaning we as in dairy farmers, we're like, oh, we have a protocol for that, right? We have a protocol for, you know, determining type of somatic cell. We have a protocol for delivering a calf. We have a proto protocol for treating a newborn calf. But you can also have proven processes throughout your business that make it easier to scale up. And those yeah. you know, processes would be documented. They're followed by all. They create consistency. And what might some of those be? We kind of already talked about it. Maybe it's a way to come to a decision, right? Okay, here's our proven process for how our leadership team is going to vote on or approve or deny a decision. Maybe it's a building decision. Maybe it's a financial purchase decision, but you have something that you follow. You can use the same for a proven process for how we're going to hire. And I know this doesn't happen because I didn't do it all the time either, as well as I do it now, you know, that we interview everyone the same way. We do the same onboard training so that everyone is getting the full package of what they deserve to have the opportunity to be a successful employee. Um, employee reviews. Usually what I hear is, oh yeah, it's probably been a year, year and a half already. We haven't done that. How do we do it again? Should I just ask them if things are do going okay? Well, that's not a, a proven process. You want some of the things that you follow consistently. Yeah. And, and sometimes they don't even have to be that complicated, right? Um, we, I, I think we could, you know, conceptually, we can all, all agree that it's, that it's a really good thing to check in with our employees and just kind of have those, Hey, how's it going? Sort of conversations, but that can mean different things to different people, uh, as far as like checking in. So a proven process might just see putting a number down, right? We're, we're going to check in with all of our employees, you know, throughout, uh, a period of time, three times a year. Um, you can have a proven process. It doesn't have to be complicated, right? We, we don't have to write massive books that, you know, that sit on the shelf. We would rather have them so simple that they're in your head and you just, you just know them versus a big dusty binder that, that no one looks at. So. Because then you can be consistent a lot easier. Yeah. Um, and so that's really important. And, and I just wanted to add, not that we're talking about employee reviews, but especially when your farm is scaling up when it's doing some type of change or growth, your employees really do want to know how they're doing. Yes. And so that might be a time you need to have a conversation more often because if their job is changing, if their role is changing, they want to know, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing okay? What should I be doing different? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So you have the proven process, we, you know, good at getting issues out on the table, getting them solved, right people, right spot, the scorecard, the strategy. But how, how do you not get pulled back, right? So when everything gets crazy, everything gets busy, your harvest comes or, or it's time to get that manure out there before it frees up. How do you keep that momentum, right? How do you keep the momentum on the business side, just like you keep the momentum on, on the production side and not really get pulled back into some old ways or, or habits? And, and it really comes down to, you, you know, so to speak, the rubber meets the road here at the bottom uh, of, this, uh, of this graphic. And, and it's, it's about taking all of the pieces and putting them together and keeping them moving because we need that power of, of the strategy and the power of all these pieces. But then there has to be action that comes behind it uh, and consistent action. Um, and a big one and a big one, and this is tough, right? And it's a, it's accountability and, um, and discipline, right? And, and we don't often as owners think about, well, I need to be accountable, right? Where, where I say, well, how do we get our employees to be more accountable? And how do, how do we get them to be more disciplined? But, but as you scale up, it really requires a different skill set uh, of discipline and accountability at the ownership level as well. Because really no one, right, at the end of the day, everyone charts their own course. And so uh, this is probably the hardest thing is to stay disciplined 
uh, and not get pulled back into into some of these um, uh, some of the old ways of doing things that maybe not maybe aren't relevant. Um, a lot of this comes down to meetings, and I, you know, as soon as we say meetings. Oh, I can just about hear the groan of everyone and maybe some eye rolls and, and everything like that. And I think we've all been part of some bad meetings, right? Uh, but they don't have to be that way. Right. And they don't have to be, you know, long. You know, once you get a system, a proven process, your daily huddle meetings, those can be five to 10 minutes long. Even your your quarterly and monthly meetings, you know, you could an hour could do it if you have a proven process, if you have an agenda, if you have a way to make decisions and address conflict and keep moving. Um, but the point again is whatever you decide, whatever changes you're making, you have to remember that they have to be communicated with everybody. Yeah. So sure, as a leadership team, it's your responsibility to make these decisions, but as a leadership team, it's your responsibility to communicate it correctly and effectively with everybody else. Yeah. So, so often, you know, decisions are made, but they just stay in that, in that room. And so it's really important to cascade that down all through, through the entire company so that everybody's on the same page and, and no one's getting blindsided by things. Um, right. And that yeah. keeps the momentum going yeah. because if you continually have these meetings, well, you're keeping up with the momentum. Um, you're continually making changes, making decisions and sharing it. But it also helps your employees, you know, continue or improve their momentum because you're constantly sharing. You know, you're not leaving them out in the dust. And so they just wonder like, well, what difference does it make if, you know, I change this or tweak that? I don't know what's going on. And yeah. that's where people lose their, their drive. And if there's not that consistent meeting flow, people don't know when the next meeting is. So they don't know when they're going to be able to air their idea and they don't know when, where, when they're going to bring up a concern. And, and, you know, if meetings only happen during a rainy day when, when you can't harvest or plant or something like that, that, that doesn't really work as well as having that, that consistent meeting. And, and we'd rather see a daily huddle that last 10 minutes that happens all the time than, than some big day and a half event that happens whenever it fits in. Uh, because things can really fester um, if, if they're not, uh, you know, if they, if they just kind of roll around in people's minds for days on end. So, so having that consistency when people know that they can, that they can bring stuff up, that's a, that, that's a real, uh, that's a real benefit. Um, what about Richard and Lon? So actually they, there, there is an ending to this, to this story. Um, you know, Richard once told me he had more fun when he had one tractor and he really wished that he could go back to that time. Uh, since then, uh, Richard actually has left farming. He sold out. It, it was so, uh, it was too much, even though he's an extremely talented person. He did not like it. it. It wasn't fine. He uh, fun. He he sold out. And Lon, he's just uh, he's just rolling along and still having a good time. So and probably one of the most relaxed farmers that I, that I know. And uh, and very uh, very progressive and very uh, very profitable as well. So we're, we're, moral go ahead, that, well. The moral of that story is you you have to do what's right for you, yeah. right? And, you know, you just said it, Richard wasn't having fun anymore. It wasn't yeah. what he wanted to do. So when you think about scaling up, and again, it's not just about you, it's about your team, your family, your leadership team, yeah. um, but you want to make sure that everyone's doing it for the right reason, they're in the right role, and they're having fun, because that's what makes scaling up an absolute blast. Yeah. Well, I think that's fantastic. I do have a question that came in and I missed it um, when we were talking about this. So I apologize to whomever uh, wrote this, but this one reads, um, so I apologize. It's also going to be a little bit later in the conversation than it should be, but it reads for scorecards. What do I do if those items or expectations are not met? For example, not getting to four of the six meetings. There absolutely has to be consequences. Yeah. And, you know, if you're talking about even the other business owners or employees, 
you can't just blow it off, right? Because we see other people doing it, we're all going to do it. So there has to be consequences. And that could mean, um, you know, maybe a change in role, maybe, you know, a written warning. And if it still continues, then the potential to lose their position. It has to be so set in stone and effective, those consequences, to make it worth having them. Because just like with our toddlers, if we make, you know, these threats, you're not going to get any dessert, and then we still give them dessert, they're going to continue with that behavior. Yeah. And, and I would add to that, even being late to the meeting, you know, uh, if, if, if the meeting starts at six o'clock, it starts at six o'clock. I mean, that's the discipline that will really propel uh, you forward. And the door gets shut, which means that anybody that had an idea or concern, they're just out of luck. And they're just going to find out from, you know, the rest of the employees what happened that day. So they're, they're going to get they're going to get left out and decisions are going to be made without them. Uh, usually that that kind of peer pressure is enough, you know, if you can be really disciplined about that, um, that, that, that's usually, that's usually enough to, uh, to get people to come around. But if, but if they don't come around, then maybe, maybe that person's not in the right spot. And then I'm just going to add too, because I know if they're, you know, back to that slide, the strategic, um, scorecard, excuse me, scorecard, it could be leadership team, right? Mm -hmm. So if you guys don't have the confidence in yourself to keep up those meetings, then have someone that is maybe a mediator at your meeting or have someone that can help hold you all accountable so that it does happen. Yeah. I think that's some great advice. Um, before we conclude here, I also have another question I want to ask because we went through a lot of really good information here today, but where do you start? If you're looking to scale up and you're like, I've got some work to do just all around that circle. Um, and they're able to identify that, yes, we need to get started on some different areas. But when you're looking at the list, it just feels overwhelming. So where is the best place to start for somebody who is really taking a look at this now? Go ahead, really get, getting that alignment. Right, talking through getting that alignment between uh, between owners, managers, outside advisors, what whatever it is that this is truly, you, you know, this is truly something that you want, and being really clear about your strengths and your weaknesses and what you, what each one brings to the table um, before you go before you jump into it because it can get a little messy, and uh, and it's not easy. Uh, to, to scale up, especially if there's a big jump. So, um, so having, having meetings and, and, and getting that alignment ar around that um, and, and taking it from there. Yeah. yeah, that's where you gotta start. You know, you have to have those conversations. You gotta, you gotta have a plan. Yep. Okay. Well, I have to say we are hitting close to that one o'clock hour. So I want to say thank you to both Liz and Tim for being such great resources here this afternoon. Um, if you missed it, go back a few minutes to check out their contact information. If you are looking to get more information or pick their brains about your business further, um, we had a great conversation, a lot of really good questions that came in. So we really appreciate your guys' time here this afternoon. Thank you for having us. So look forward to more questions. <laughs> Fantastic. I also want to say thank you to all of our sponsors here at PDPW for making programs like the Dairy Signal possible. It wouldn't be done without sponsors like Dairy Herd Management, as well as our um, entire list of national sponsors, which you can find at our website um, under PDPW Prime to make sure to support them um, and really appreciate all that they have done for us. But we are just getting started here this uh, week here on the Dairy Signal. We've got a lot of really great things coming up, um, including tomorrow, where we're going to be talking about some graduate research that's come from the University of Florida. So, or yes, University of Florida. I didn't want to mix it up with the Florida State. But make sure to tune in tomorrow to learn more about that and to see what that is all about. Um, we've got some really great stuff coming up. But for now, we wish you a great Tuesday afternoon. Stay safe, stay healthy this harvest season, and we'll see you here tomorrow on the Dairy Signal. Bye now.